Uh, today's presenter is Joe Harris. He works for the Iowa DNR as a digital forester. Is it still working? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Sure. Okay. Um, he's been a digital forester for seven years. Uh, he got his degree from Iowa State University. We can't get this straight. Seven. Seven years at Iowa. Yes. Yes. Okay. But he got his degree from Iowa State University. He's got his bachelor's and master's in forestry. And he's here talking about spread brain. Also, this uh, show is being recorded, so please save your questions for the end. There will be time allowed for them. Okay, can we do a sound check? Okay, in the back, can you hear me all right? Good. Yes. Thank you, Sherry. All right, so we'll go ahead and get rolling here. This is, yes, right on time. This is prescribed burning for landowners. And my name is Joe Harris. All right, just a brief uh, outline or introduction here to show you kind of the, the two parts that I broke this program down into. We're going to spend just a little bit of time on the front and uh, cover some of the considerations or the reasons that landowners do burning. And I understand how that these can be kind of done, overdone, ad nauseum, where you get tired of the philosophy of burning and want to get right into the, the nitty gritty stuff of, of you know, how, how best to do it and tips and tricks of the trade. So I'll probably spend a little more time in the second half on, on that, what I call the tech manual. Before we go any further, though, I'm just kind of curious to learn a little bit about you, the audience members. And so if I, if I get you to raise your hand to the first question, who, who's been doing a little bit of burning already? Very good. Quite a few. So if you're, if you're here, then you, you must uh, at least feel like you have a few things still to learn, or you just maybe want to review, um, to see if there's anything that you could be doing differently. And that's great, so uh, thanks for coming. And has anyone here hired anybody professionally to carry out a burden on their property? All right, maybe just a uh, half a dozen or so people raise their hands for that. Well, that really gets to the heart of why I wanted to do this program. Um, I do, well, my, I should say my family, my brother, my two brothers and a dad, we do a little bit of uh, custom CRP work. Uh, they do some seedings, and we do a little bit of burning every spring for, for other people. We, it started as us do, just doing our own burns, and then people uh, uh, needed help with theirs, and so they started asking us to do some of theirs. And so I know very well how expensive it is to hire somebody uh, to come on your property and carry out a burn, because it's very risky. There's uh, liability and risk issues. And I work with private landowners in my state job daily, and I'm trying to give them advice and encourage them um, in situations where they can use prescribed burning. And unfortunately, most of them have zero or very little experience with doing burning. And so we, we reach this, this dead end of, you know, they want, to, they want to do what's right on their land or they want to improve uh, the, the conditions of their, their woodlands or prairies, but they don't have the necessary skills to do burning. They're afraid of what risks they might entail. And yet, you know, to bring somebody in, it's really expensive. Plus, there's just not that many people professionally who are doing for me. So my, my goal with this program is to, is to give you every kind of bit of knowledge that I have uh, so that you might feel more confident, comfortable looking at <coughs> burning on your own place. <coughs> Part of that is just because burning is, in, in a lot of cases, it, it doesn't have a real acute impact. If you only do one burn, it, it doesn't change a whole lot. So with woodlands especially, it's, it's more of a chronic thing. It takes repeated burning to, to accomplish the goals. Okay, so before we get woodland burn, who's doing woodland burns? And then people, other people here just doing strictly prairie burns or burning? Okay, well, even more than that. Great. All right, I'm just going to touch very briefly one slide each on grasslands and one slide for woodlands. Some of the reasons why people do prescribe burning. So in grasslands and CRP issues, probably the most obvious reason that comes to mind, the one that you can see with your own eyes visibly, is just to control trees and shrubs from coming into CRP. That's mainly a factor of where we live. Here in the Midwest and, and anywhere east of us, we get enough annual rainfall and precip that trees and shrubs naturally encroach in prairies. They succeed if given enough time and without any kind of burning or mowing or grazing disturbance. So if you go from here out west, the way west is, through the Great Plains and the Dakotas, uh, Nebraska, the, the Front Range of Colorado, it's very arid out there. We're getting fewer than 10 inches of rain a year, and that's why shortgrass prairie dominates out there. 
So if we want to keep prairie prairie, we have to set fire to it. Um, certain noxious weeds are, are negatively affected by fire. Usually these are ones that are not native to North America um, uh, or just not native to a fire-based ecosystem. So, so uh, fire can help control some of those. And then just, just this concept of managing habitat. And if you have CRP, um, and one of your reasons for doing burning might be because you're mandated to by the government to, to fulfill your mid-contract management clause. But the reason for that is basically because of habitat. So over time, um, that grass builds up, it gets really rank, really thick, and doing these burns sweeps off all that residue, creates some bare ground for a temporary period of time, and that's what you see uh, this image here is a little baby uh, chick uh, quail. So a lot of critters need that bare ground when they're young. Uh, it also results in, in kind of a rebirth or a rejuvenation of that vegetation. As far as uh, woodlands and oak savannas go, the, the reasons for doing burning much, you know, in principle are the same. Um, it might vary a little bit. So, you know, in oak woodland, usually we're trying to use fire to control certain kinds of trees. Um, we want to favor, maybe we want to favor oaks uh, at the expense of hard maple or enol or hackberry or basswood. Uh, and of course, oak, the reason that that works is that oak sort of co-evolved with fire for many thousands of years. And so as some other species such as pine, um, jack pine has those serotonous cones that takes fire to heat them up and, and to allow germination. Pines are also uh, what we call pioneer species that tend to need that disturbance to come in. Um, and whereas your spruces and firs usually come later in the ecosystem chart, they succeed pines. So for, you know, promoting certain kinds of trees and promoting uh, certain kinds of vegetation, herbaceous wildflowers and grasses would be All right, how about some really not good reasons for doing prescribed burning? We need to cover these two. So things like, you know, just I've been reading some blogs late at night when I can't sleep and it just sounds like it's a good idea. Or, you know, fire is natural and without fire the land can't be healthy. Or, uh, you know, well, I'm just a pyromaniac and, and Helps, helps me feel better about myself to set stuff on fire. Uh, to an ecologist, you know, those may be fine, good enough reasons for you personally. As, as an ecologist, we look for, you know, some kind of um, objective reason when it comes to the, managing the habitat, why you're doing that burning. Partly, the, one of the ways that the topics in that slide that I want to address is whether these landscape-based fires that occurred before European settlement were truly natural. And this may be um, a completely new topic to you, or it may be old hat, but uh, as soon as you start to look into the matter, you realize that the vast majority of, of what we call wildfires that occurred in the Midwest were actually being set by Native Americans. So an author, uh, probably the most uh, productive author on the subject is Henry T. Lewis, but there's others. Uh, he identified at least 70 different reasons that Native Americans would use fire to help shape the landscape or mold the landscape and that are all listed there. And then we have settlers' journals uh, when, when the Europeans first began arriving that described the practice of how this was Paul Wilhelm, or I suppose that was Paul Wilhelm. Uh, he, he mentioned in his journal, the Indians know how to use the fire um, with, I'm sorry, how to fire the prairie with great skill and how to take advantage of favorable wind. And despite the fact that all around the village the grass was burned, the cornfields nearby were unharmed. And there's many, many, many other accounts of, of settlers' journals. I won't go through all these, but you know, just in brief, they all talk about the Indians annually setting fire to the prairie, fire passes annually over the prairie, uh, the Indian practice of firing the herbage annually. Um, since the prairie grass is no longer burned off annually, as it used to be by the Indians, and then that author went on to talk about this phenomenon that as soon as, essentially as soon as the Native Americans were kicked out of the landscape and that no one was intentionally or deliberately setting those fires, the, the brush grew up. And the brush has basically been growing up for 150 years. So that's kind of where we're at today. Uh, whoops. Just one more quote here. This is from a guy named Jerry Wilhelm of the Conservation Research Institute. He's a PhD and he's been around in this field for quite a long time. In one of his reports, he says, in all of our combined research into pre-settlement landscape descriptions, 
There's not a single account of lightning as a source of a grassland or a timber fire in the Midwest. Nearly all accounts of the fires were annual. <coughs> Indians said usually autumn or in the fall. Dry lightning, uh, dry lightning rarely, if ever, occurs when the prairie is dry. So it's the simple fact that, I mean, and this makes sense if you think about it. It's not very often that you hear about a fire just being randomly set by lightning um, in today's day and age. It's usually somebody who put a cigarette butt out the window into a, a dry CRP field where they set it on purpose. <coughs> Hopefully it's not somebody in this talk who's going to go and set fire to their CRP and have it escape on accident. But getting back to the point, whether, whether, you know, whether or not uh, a fire is set intentionally or, or not, you need to be aware of some reasons for not specifically not doing burning on your property you might be that you just might be doing more damage than do it. So not all plants benefit from burning. This is a shot of some pine trees uh, along a driveway in central Iowa. Right next to the pine trees was a thick uh, prairie or grassland area that they burned off and it just really torched a lot of those pine trees in that scene. Here is a CRP tree planting that's somewhere between five and 10 years old that I had to go look at because uh, fire escaped through it. And it had a lot of evergreen trees or some pines that had been planted. Uh, you can see the row of pines down this side. You can see the row of either pine or spruces on that side. And then right down the center here is a row of deciduous trees. All these plants you can see got impacted by that fire. Can anybody tell just from the photo what kind of trees these are, these deciduous ones? Oak? Yeah. Those are bur oak. Yeah. And we often hear about bur oak and how tolerant they are of fiber because they have this thick, porky bark, right? Well, when you get right down to it, um, fire is a destructive tool. I've heard that said by uh, Gary Byer, who is a retired district forester in Iowa. And, and I like that quote. And, and he said, fire is a destructive tool, and that's why we use it in certain situations, because we want to destroy some plants, but we want to make sure that we don't destroy the ones uh, that we didn't intend to. So whether or not uh, you know, bur oak has thick bark or not, if the temperature is heated up at, at, those, at that cellular tissue level to 122, 131 degrees Fahrenheit, it's going gonna, it's gonna to kill tissue, it's going to kill cells. And it's a function of both the intensity, how hot it gets, and for how long it stays there. So it's like, you know, you think of grilling, you can, you can smoke at a very low temperature for a long time, you know, or you can, you can broil at a very high temperature for a short period. It doesn't matter to the plant. If it gets up to that, if it gets up to that temperature, it's going to cook. And of course, so there's all kinds of variables involved with the dictate or guide you know, whether or not that temperature is reached. Um, but bottom line is, is it can do damage. Moreover, looking outward in scale from just the plant level to the ecosystem level is that not all ecosystems require uh, fire to be healthy. So this is a maple basswood forest community on the north facing slope of the river. Um, it, it does not, it does not, fire does not do, does not help a maple basswood community sustain itself. It injures the maple basswood. Now that may be what you want if you're trying to go backwards to oaks. But if you're trying to help those trees out, that would not be a good use of fire. This, this ecosystem succession chart finds its way into almost every talk that I do it in. Um, but what this shows, of course, is, and you've seen it probably before, over here, this is a timeline. So over here is a, a raging stand replacing a catastrophic fire that occurs. And then going right across the chart, we, we start uh, gaining years or time since that fire. So initially, within the first two years, we get annual plants and weeds. And then we start to see perennials, grasses showing up, and eventually trees and shrubs. And then with time, this is mature oak hickory forest at 150 years. Maple basswood communities would be even further over to the right than this chart goes. And so the use of fire in this case is, is that that's, that's where it starts back over. It's a reset button. Here's a, a bottomland, riparian, wetlands type of, of forest. This is a silver maple, cottonwood willow type of trees. And you can see standing water right there in the front. So that's not going to benefit from fire. That's, fire would not normally have, have uh, crept into that, that wet environment. And then here's a planting, another tree planting from the CRP. That, this is oaks, this is pines. Both of those are fire, what we think of as fire associated or fire evolved species. 
but this is only about 15 to 20 year old planting. And so to use fire in this uh, situation would be a misuse of fire because it's, the system is not ready to restart itself yet. It's not ready to regenerate itself yet, and it would just be damaging. Uh, this map has shown an awful lot of fire programs too. This just shows the what they call the fire return interval for different ecosystems of the country. And there I highlighted the, the tri-state area. As you can kind of try to match the colors, I'll show you, I'll highlight which ones are shown there. So the yellow and the blue areas, at least through what cover most of Iowa, those are showing uh, stand replacement fires every with at least one every ten years. They didn't go longer than 10 years without seeing fire. Um, but as you get into the darker blue, you, you extend out to a 34th. So these dark blue areas that you see in eastern Iowa, through Illinois, parts of Wisconsin, that could go as long as 34 years without fire. And then you get into northern Wisconsin and, and even the Driftless region, and you get into green colors where those, those ecosystems would have gone you know, 200 to 500 years without fire. So the bottom line with all of this, I think this is the last, the last I'll talk about the considerations of the is that you just want to make sure you're using the right tools on the job. That, that fire is a tool. <coughs> you know, Aldo pointed out that we have other tools available to us. If you boil it, if you really boil it down to uh, the essentials, when you're managing habitat or managing ecosystems, you really just have two choices. You're either creating plants or you're destroying them. The shovel is used to create them by planting species or planting vegetation. The axe is used to destroy those plants. And of course, he went on later to add some additional tools for habitat management, uh, grazing, plowing, or um, you can think of mowing to fire, and of course, population control when it comes to animals. So it's, it's just a good idea to, to have, uh, whether it's a forester or whether it's a, a prairie expert, um, whether it's an ecologist, somebody who, who uh, you know, has some understanding and training in, in the ecology field, it'd be good to have that out get some qualified advice before you leap into the, the waterhead first and fire. Ultimately, you know, what we really want is diversity. We don't, it's, it's not about a blanket prescription we use fire everywhere. It's, we want the best of both worlds. So, uh, north facing slopes, cool and moist, steep terrain, you know, those might be better suited to maple basket communities where on these, like on the top of a ridge or on a south facing slope, it stays real hot and dry. It's going to be more conducive to uh, perpetuating oaks and hickories and prairie grasses. So you might use burning in there, you might use no burning on the other side of the hill. Alright, now I'm going to move on to the next subject. So, how about for you, the modern day fire setter, what are some of the techniques, <coughs> some of the principles? Of course, with everything, the first thing is to have a plan if you're building a house, if you're, uh, if you're going about um, man, doing a, let's say, timber harvest, you want to have a plan. So you need to see the big picture. There's several things involved with that. First and foremost, you know, the boundaries of where that fire needs to happen versus the, the perimeter where you don't want it to escape to. Where you might have some natural fire breaks coming in, like rivers or roads. Uh, homes and livestock. This is an issue not just because fire might escape and, and burn out towards a home or a livestock facility, but the smoke. So we have to really be aware of that. Uh, I put roads on here not as, as a form of a natural fire break, but as a form of it draw people. You know? So traffic that occurs along the roads is uh, something to consider. Um, you see all the time these newspaper uh, headlines that somebody caused a 70 car pile up because they were in Iowa a few years ago a guy who burned a bunch of old rotten hay bales right along a four lane interstate federal highway and the wind shifted and went the other way and just totally smoked out the section of highway and the cars just piled up. So it's bad deal. Um, power lines are something to watch out for. Of course if there a lot of these older power lines are very low and droopy and we have to burn underneath some of those and we have to be real careful about how much heat is going right up on those lines. There's also some kind of safety factor, they say, with smoke and putting particular matter in the air underneath the power lines that could cause some kind of electrical static and shock. Um, gullies and other kinds of gullies are the things that you, know, you, need, you need to watch out for in case you're driving and you're rushing to put out a spot fire and find yourself falling into a 10-foot uh, eroded gully. 
Of course, you need to know where your access points are, and it's important to know, you know how the terrain lies so that there's a big hill in between you and, and the rest of your party. Uh, you'll find some way to communicate. So I'm just going to kind of zoom in. This is a map that was sent to me by a landowner, and he said, you know, we need to burn areas A and B and C for my CRP mid-contract management next year. Um, and I should just mention real quick, if you're doing CRP mid-contract management and it's a big area that needs to be burned, you may have been told, or you may have to break that up into roughly one third by one third by one third uh, units, because they want they don't want you to burn off your entire chunk of habitat all at once um, and eliminate all of the nesting cover all at once. So that's just something to remember. Uh, but here, I just kind of want to review the plan or have you look at this with regards to the different features and elements to consider. So. You know, this is all a grass area here. There's some, these are some agricultural fields on the north side. You can see there's a house right here in this corner. Uh, this is a unit of grass here. So right off the bat, I'm starting to look at this map and thinking about which way uh, the wind is going to blow the smoke and where can I put the smoke. That's one of the toughest things anymore. It seems like more suburban development or sprawl there is, it's just harder and harder to find a, a safe place to let the smoke blow away without having go right into some house. So anyway, with this, I probably can't burn with a straight west wind because it's going to really smoke these people out, or a straight south wind. Uh, down here we've got, looks like another house right here, so we'd have to watch out if we're trying to burn here to see on one uh, southwest wind, and here is a house with some livestock facilities as well. Of course, we've got a road coming up the, the right side of the picture there, and a road along the south side. Um, can't think of anything else that I can see. You can't see it probably from here, but this is a CRP tree planting, and these are forest areas that we're trying to not let that fire go into for whatever reason. It's just usually good practice to keep the fires contained in the burn units. A uh, topographic map kind of helps shake out where some of the, the hills and the valleys lie. Although really in the end, you know, and this matters mostly if, if you don't live on, on the property that you're looking to burn and, and you're not out there all the time. But there's really no substitute for just getting out and walking the place and seeing how the vegetation um, arranges itself. So you'll have some heavy, <coughs> thick grass and you'll have some thinner, scary grass that might not put in the pot. You'll have some trees. You'll see how the hills lie. But really, at the end of the, when I, when I look at this map, the two things that I'm really trying to get at, number one, is which winds can I, can I burn with? In this case, I'm going to say I've got a northwest, a north, and a northeast. And then secondly, how, how might I want to break down the burn unit into smaller pieces that are more manageable subunits? Um, because by doing that, number one, it just helps if something goes wrong, let's say the wind changes. Instead of burning this whole great big area in one chunk, you know, I might be able to uh, deal with any kind of problems that arise or arose by having these, these two pieces broken apart sideways. Might also help too because, um, you know, I might not want a west wind in this case, but I could burn, I could probably burn this with a west wind and be okay, you know, as long as I got good fire breaks between them. Because by the time the smoke gets from here clear over here, it's gonna be dispersed and up in the atmosphere. So that helps too. But mostly it, it helps you figure out what you need to do with the fire breaks. And so this is the, Probably the biggest take-home message I want to send you away with is, you know, in the category of lessons learned, there's just absolutely no substitute for, for having really good fire breaks. And in my mind, the more I do burning, the more I think there's no good excuse for not having good fire breaks. Because once you've got a fire lit, you're, you're out of luck if, that, if the wind changes or something goes wrong. But if you spend time in advance, before you light that fire, and you do your work beforehand, there's really no good reason to make really good fire breaks. You got all the time in the world before fire breaks lit to do that. And we live in the agricultural Midwest. I mean, there's a, a brush hog mower, a, a plow and a disc, you know, to the tune of probably one per square mile at least that you go out there. So neighbors have this stuff, uh, uh, custom farmers have this stuff, uh, tenants. It's not hard to line up and put it even if you don't want it yourself. You know, pay somebody a few bucks or to buy a dinner or whatever to, to go mow those fire breaks and, and break it. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how we do our fire breaks, how, how I think it really works best. 
Uh, probably top top line would just be repeated mowing. If you just constantly keep those fire breaks mowed, and I don't mean during the nesting season, you got to watch out for that if you're in CRP. You can't be mowing uh, what the date is May 15th, August 1st, somewhere around there. But you could as soon as the the nesting season ends, you can get back out there and start mowing it. But what that does, if you keep mowing it, it's just like your yard. It just stays green all the time, and you never have this buildup of residue thick grass to deal with. Mm -hmm. So here in this picture you can see that real nicely. That's a very narrow fire break and in this case it's probably okay because you can kind of see the smoke is blowing away from uh, to the away from this chunk of grass. Uh, but that's just that's probably somebody's walking path where they go walk their dog every night. It's probably a suburban area. But that works great for a fire break. Maybe they widen it a little bit. <laughs> Um, if you can't just, if, you, if you're not on the property all the time or you just can't afford to mow it all the time, the next best option I think is to mow it in the fall and then use a hay rake to break up all the, all the residue. The reason I say mow it in the fall is because it's usually drier in the fall than it is in the spring. You don't have to deal with snow melt uh, and spring rains. And secondly is that gives it time in the spring just to green up the so it just it, it gets you one, there's one fewer thing in the spring that you have to worry about. And the hay raking is real important too, just because that fire will easily run right across the mowed fire break that hasn't been raked in any way. All that slash, all that residue just laying there burns just fine. Um, but by raking it off too, that, that lets that sunlight get down there uniformly to the ground and greens it up no more for the spring of that moisture. So if, if you want to go as as uh, far out as doing like plowing and disking or a cultivator or tiller of some kind. I had a buddy who used a harrow. He bought it from Cabela's, I think, and he just drug it around and around and around and around and around, uh, probably hundreds of times. And, and that worked pretty well because it really just kind of finally eradicated all the vegetation off that surface and it just kind of bare dirt. That worked great. Anything you can do to scrape it. Um, Here's kind of some general rules as far as how wide these fire breaks need to be, especially if you're like this in the middle of a burn unit. It's 15 feet wide or three or four times as, as tall as that grass is. And then, it, it, you know, the difference between this picture here on the left and this picture on the right is probably two weeks, maybe 10 days. This is probably, hmm, say, late March, and this is probably the second week of April. And so we, all the time, we will go out and do a burn and go, you know what, it's just too early. This is really hard to control. If we give this a couple weeks or even a week, uh, it's going to green up and, that, and it's way easier to come back and after having money to let that green up. All right, now in the woodlands, your fire breaks are very different. Um, it's probably a little bit easier. All you really need is a leaf blower or a rake. Uh, you don't have to get real fancy or expensive. This case is a nice backpack leaf blower. And that's, if you do a lot of burning, especially in the timber, you'll want to probably want to get one at some point because they are an indispensable tool. But you only need to really blow the leaves off of a 10-foot wide strip. It, you know, if you can do wider, that's, that's good. Um, but that's usually all that all we do. And if, it always helps, of course, if you can use an existing road or some kind of trail, even a deer path. To, to put your fire line on because those, when the compaction of those areas uh, kind of tamps that down and use that leaf blower, just blows it off a lot cleaner. All right, and speaking of woodland birds and the fire lines, um, the, I use the word fireproofing here. Uh, this is something that I, I really encourage you to do before you set fire in the woods, especially if it's the first time that the area has seen a burn. Um, what I mean is just to walk definitely around the perimeter and also through the burn unit and you're going to deal with certain things like one thing if you just have a tree or a log that's laying across your fire line you need to get that either you move your fire line around that tree or you need to cut a section out of that tree and get it off your fire line so because that fire will definitely catch a down tree and then burn right across your line. The other thing is this is a big deal if you have a standing dead tree now if it's in the middle of the unit it's going to catch it's probably definitely going to catch. If it's in the middle of your unit, it's probably not that big of a deal. It catches the smolders, it might spew some sparks out of the top. As long as the wind doesn't really pick up the it's probably okay. But if, that, if that's a standing dead tree, which this one right here is, if you look up eventually, if you can see this tree is broken off in a storm, and uh, it's hollow down here at the base, but it's right next, this is our fire line, and this tree was right next to it, 
And once it caught fire, we could see the writing on the wall. It was just going to sit there and smolder for hours, if not days, until eventually it probably would have just fallen over right across our line. So had we noticed that beforehand, had we gone through and fireproofed that unit real well, we could have either cut that tree down, um, we could have moved our fire break somewhere else around the tree. Um, I, don't know, I don't know what the third option there would be. But in the end, what we had to do is use an incredible amount of water to put that thing out. But I've heard stories of other people being out there at night, operating a chainsaw to cut down trees like that, which sounds very crazy, but they're really worried that, because at night is when you start to see the sparks flying on the wood of the birds. And, uh, and they were just worried that it was going to chimney out and catch the neighbor's patch on fire. So also, um, a thing here is, if you get a pile of wood built up and accumulated around the base of an important tree or a crop tree, a desirable tree, that stuff will catch, and that'll sit there and smolder at a very high temperature, and it'll definitely uh, burn and kill the tissue of even a big mature oak. So you need to just, you don't have to do very much, but you just pull it away or just chainsaw, cut it up in smaller pieces, get it away from the base of those good trees. Just, just throw it off somewhere else. And then, of course, anything can roll down the hill. This just shows, here, uh, the landowner went through and just cut short sections. These logs were laying right across the line where we were going to leaf blow. And, you know, he could have maybe just picked up the whole thing and thrown it off, but he just cut out some small sections so that those, those down logs didn't carry fire right across our line. And then over here on the right, a big piece of down tree log that's on the ground that uh, caught fire. You can see how hot that is. But so if that's laying up against the base of the tree, uh, it's going to do some a little damage here. You just had this was a branch that was laying right next to a bur oak. This was in a swamp white oak savanna area that the major conservancy owns, and it torched that side of that tree. So now that tree is going to incur rot decay on that side. It may not kill the tree outright, definitely won't do it acutely, but it can lead to chronic or secondary problems with that decay insect. And of course, obviously, it probably goes without saying, but if you've got some natural fire breaks that you can use, that's always better. Always. Roads are great. Bodies of water. But I'm, I'm, so in summary of all the stuff I've said about fire breaks, is I want, I want burning. If you're doing it as a hobby, you're doing it on your own. You know, I want it to be stress-free and kind of relaxed. And with good fire breaks, it is very fun to do for straight burning. So that was our crew there enjoying themselves. All right. <clears throat> Beyond that, you know, there's many other considerations on these. They have these templates for developing your prescribed burn plans. A lot of different considerations on there, and I can go through each one of these individually. I'm just going to talk about some of the most important ones. Uh, this may be old hat for some of you if you've been burning, but if you're new to it, you need to know. You know, don't be don't be lighting up CRP or grassland fires when your winds are exceeding 20 miles per hour. And, and pay attention too, there's a big difference between what the steady wind speed is versus the gusting wind. Uh, you know, the scariest situations I think that I've seen are when the burn. It probably is, it shouldn't be scary because the winds are so light, but you just have no confidence of how your fire's going to behave when a front is coming through and the winds start to flip flop back and forth. Think of your favorite politician or his opponent. <laughs> Flippy floppy winds are real scary. Um, temperature doesn't really matter a whole lot when it comes to burning in CRP land, other than if it gets really, really hot, it's probably going to be also really, really dry, or maybe really, really windy, um, and that fire behavior, you know, can get real aggressive. But the other thing is, if it gets, if you're trying to fall, uh, burn in the fall, which we do sometimes in October, November, you know, it gets under 30 degrees and the water freezes up and the pumps don't work. So, and then the, the relative humidity, humidity is also very important. Um, when it gets real dry, below 40% RH, it gets a little scary. And it's amazing how this changes so fast over the day. You can even feel it. I don't use one of the little devices to measure the RH um, instantly while I'm out in the field doing burns. But you can notice it, especially in the evening time when the humidity comes back up, and you just notice it cools off and the moisture in the air and the fire just really dampens down. So um, be real wary if you start a fire early in the morning and it carries into the afternoon. When it comes to woodlands, the conditions are kind of the same, except that you can usually go a little bit hotter, drier, windier than you do with CRP grassland burns. 
Because in the woods, obviously, a, you know, a 15 mile or 20 mile wind out, that's out in the open is going to be diminished when you're in the trees. And woodlands, of course, just don't have the same amount of fuel to carry that fire. The fuel in the woodland burn is, is basically open, at least the first time you go about doing it. So you can, it's actually kind of advantageous to have a little bit stronger wind speed if you're going to do a woodland burn. Also, it would be a little bit helpful maybe to have a little bit lower RH, warmer temperature. And I, I have just found in my experience, at least for the first time I do a woodland burn in a unit, um, fall seems to be ideal, but in November it feels like you get these, these warm fronts that come through and get bigger in the woods out south and the temperature goes up to 40, 50 degrees. So it's no good for, for being in the bow stand, which I like to do, but it's fine for doing a burn. Um, the, Statement I've heard that I really like is that you know in the Midwest or in Iowa you get maybe five good days a year to do a woodland burn, and so you better be ready to go when one of those five days arrives. All right, I want to talk about timing real briefly. Um, timing is very related to weather, but what I mean by timing here is more about the stage of growth when you conduct the burns, and that's going to have some impacts on the, the outcome. So, for instance. Like the picture shows in the top, this is this is a burn that was being done in November. Everything was dormant, so it's fall. In that season, there's nothing green and alive in this perennial. You're not really inflicting damage on anything, but you're just creating uh, open black space so that the first thing in the spring, that sunlight shines down and hits it, it instantly starts to green up the early season plants, like cool season grasses, like Rome or Reed Mary, um, and also flowers or forbs. So uh, conversely, if, if we look down here, and this gentleman's doing a burn in, I'm going to say, early May, mid May, a lot of stuff is greened up. If that's, or if that's perennial cool season grass like brome, that's going to stress that out by putting that fire on it. So it would tend to favor the later season. It would hurt early season to favor the warm season grasses that come later. Um, a couple other just things to think about there is, you know, later on in the season, so you're burning in May or June, you're going to have insects out and uh, you may have some pheasants starting to nest. You know, there are wildlife impacts there to consider. You're certainly going to have a lot more smoke the greener it is. And your burn intensity will be a little bit less the later on you go, which sometimes is what you want to help control. Now with woodlands, it doesn't matter as much uh, because you're almost always going to be relegated, in my opinion, to farming during the dormant season. Because it's really just about whenever you can with the weather. But if you have a woodland that you're able to do a burn in the spring after some stuff is greened up or weaned out, if you've got buckthorn, if you've got honeysuckle, uh, if you've got uh, gooseberry that leaves out very early, you, know, you might have a great garlic monster, you might have a great impact on those plants after they've budded or weaned out. All right, now I'm not a real big, you know, you need to go spend thousands of dollars on fancy equipment kind of guy. So, for me, the, the minimalist approach, if you're just doing small-scale burning on your, on your own property, uh, is, is shown right here. A drip torch is number one for me. If, you're, if you've never done burning and, and or you're just getting into it, you're probably not going to want to spend 140 bucks on a drip torch. But if you get the chance to try one and compare it to using your little propane torch, man, you'll probably never go back. Because those are, these things are really, really nice. They're just so much more efficient, faster. And that's the mix that, that I recommend, or that's not, I shouldn't recommend anything, but that's the mix we use. It's about two-thirds diesel, one-third gasoline. Um, sometimes a little bit hotter. My brother likes a little bit hotter. <laughs> uh, and then uh, a couple of hand tools are always nice to have on hand. The flapper that you see, you know, that's kind of a novelty, I think, for, especially for people that are doing it already. It's just a piece of mud flap that's attached to a stick and you just drag it over the ground and smother the fire out with it. Uh, we don't really use it very much, especially once you have some water. You just don't use the flappers. Um, but these these two tools right here are sure nice. You know, a backpack. All this stuff, by the way, the flappers, drip torch, these water sprayers, you can purchase from any of those vendors. And uh, these things inevitably leak down your butt and, and you get all that. But um, maybe not from the do so much. But you quit time, it really just takes some pain. So, and the leaf blower doesn't, like I said, doesn't have to be this great big thing that goes in your backpack, not, or in your back. 
my dad uses uh, just this little handheld one. It's gas powered. I mean, it can't be electric, of course, but it it does the job too, at least to some degree. And if you're going to scale up and be burning bigger areas, or, um, especially large CRP grasslands, you're we'll probably going to want something a little more heavy duty. So there's our rig as a ranger. Uh, we, we, we just took it in and had a, a sprayer come and kind of rig up our, our water system. That was very simple. We didn't have to mess with it at that point. So, and you need, you need good communication. I, we sure like the walkie-talkies. We all have cell phones, of course. But the nice thing about walkie-talkies is you don't have to you know, unlock it, and then you don't have to find the number that you want to call. You just, you just talk right into it. And then everybody else can listen in to hear what's going on as well. So that's pretty nice. Just a short checklist here of, you know, before you set the fire. Um, you don't want to be this guy uh, having to find the sheriff's phone number after the thing's going to not him. <laughs> so check all your equipment. You got pumps. You need to make sure they're gassed up and ready to go and that they, they function. Talk to your neighbors down, you know, this, this is where a personal touch goes a long ways. Because you knock on the door and say, hey, I'm, I'm this person. We're going to be doing a burn over here, and there might be a little bit of smoke. We don't expect the smoke to come on your house, but, you know, if the wind changes, it could. And you should get your laundry off the line, and if anything has an happen. And usually what they say is, you know, uh, I'm always worried, sick, they're going to go, you know, I'll sue your, I'll sue your tail if you, if you put any smoke in my house. But usually they say, oh, cool, can we come watch, you know? Yeah, that's fine. So, so talk to the neighbors. You know, call ahead to the county sheriff. Let them know. Here's who I am. Here's where we are. The 911 address. We're going to do this prescribed fire. Um, don't come here unless you get a phone call from me. And you got to make sure that, that they're clear on that. And, and of course, you want to put your cell phone then on either a very loud ringtone or on a vibrate setting so that you can feel it. Like because when you get the fire lit, it's crackling and noisy, or if you're in an ATV, or if you're running a leaf blower, or you know, a water pump is running, a lot of times you won't hear that phone ring. And then what happens is, you know, you've got a very busy highway right there, and the Cedar Falls Fire Department shows up, and full turnout here, and there's four trucks, and, and it looks really bad. <laughs> and, and yeah, you've got about four missed calls on your phone from the county dispatch, and you didn't hear from uh, all right, I want to show you some of the techniques that we use when it comes to actually igniting or, or doing the burn. So, as a refresher for a lot of you, I'm sure, uh, the terms, you know, when your wind direction, let's say it's, it's out of the, the north, the fire light in the downwind side is called your backfire. That's what's going to uh, creep backwards into the wind in a very nice uniform case, very slowly, very steadily. But of course, it's got the wind at its back, so, so it's wanting to push. Uh, southward in this case. And then your head fire up here on top is, is where it's got all the fuel out in front of it and all the wind in the back. So it's going to advance very, very fast, probably five to ten times fast as the back fire creeps backwards. The flank fires are just what's on the side. They're kind of, uh, they're, they're not real aggressive. They're kind of a mixture of the two. This is a nice little chart that, that just shows this. Um, in this case, they had a, you know, a natural fire break, a water body right here, and the firefighters would have lit the first fire along that natural fire break, and then with the wind direction, which you see up here, which is coming from the left across to the right, this fire would have just nicely backed up into the wind, and they would have been working to control it here along the flank. You can see how it's, it's uh, backing into that wind. And then eventually, when they have this black area built up right here, they can loop back around on the back side and light these head fires, which are they going to race over to the right. And, and the fire is using fire against fire. Uh, the back fire, of course, is what you spend most of your time working on. So when you do these prescribed burns, you know, you'll spend four fifths of your time controlling the back burn. Um, and then when you get around and light the head fire, it all ends very fast after that. And it's, it's fairly quick. So, you know, controlling the backfire is, is the toughest part. And what we generally do is, is we just light these short strips, 10 to 15 yards long, and we just let that advance um, back into that burn unit um, until we make sure that we know that it's, it's contained and safe. And then we light off another strip. 
The, the trick that I guess I want to make sure you're aware of, if, you're, if you haven't used leaf blowers before on these birds and you're thinking about doing it, is the backfire is not the time for the leaf blowers. It's the time for the water. When, you, when you've got the wind in your face and the fire going away from you and you try to use that leaf blower, it just kind of tornadoes back up in your face with soot and ash. Um, you actually fan the flames and it looks to cause more problems. So, so use your water on the back fire and then you're going to use those leaf blowers when you're on the sides or the, the head plant side. This picture just shows kind of a nice uh, view of, of letting that back fire do its work. All right, the wind is coming from the left over to the right. We've lit our, this way a mode fire right here and we've lit fire right along there. The fire is backing up this way. Uh, you know, that's plenty of black now that we can we can move back around and light that head fire. And these guys, oh, we, haven't, we haven't gone and lit the head fire yet because these guys are still in the smoke working on a couple of spot fires that are trying to creep out across that line. So you want this is what you really gotta watch is the smoke. You know, it's it's not it's not so much about worrying that someone's gonna get burned over with the big smoke that you gotta pay attention to. And if you're running a drift torch, you know, it's your responsibility to not put so much fire out that these guys are going to have to go back and work in the smoke for the rest of the afternoon. I'm going to show you a tip um, with using water wet lines that we use all the time when we're doing our back fire or our back burns. So imagine here, um, we've got this is a big chunk of CRP, and the wind is coming out of the, the west, and here's our mode fire break. So what we'll do is we'll, we'll go along it, it can happen anywhere in this mode of fire break unless it's real green, and then, and then the vacuum player is not going to cross that green uh, fire break. But generally, we'll put it right on the edge or where the, the junction is of the, un, of the burn unit and the mode of fire break. We just drop this wet line. We just spray water at about a 12 to 18 inch strip. Um, and then, ideally, using the tires of the ATV or the truck to just run over that as much as we can back and forth. We don't do that a whole lot, but I, I try to, just because it takes a lot of back and forth. But what that compression or compaction does is it lays the vegetation flat. Um, it, if, it's not, if there is no vegetation, it's just soil, it just helps hold that moisture in. It doesn't dry out as fast. It just kind of makes it a, a little zone of sloppy, you know, wet mud. And it really helps. And then you, you're going to come in and put your fire right on the inside of that wet line. And the idea is then that that fire will not the wind is pushing it, trying to push across your, your wet line and then your, your mode fire break, but it can't because it's just too wet. The humidity is real high, close to the ground there. Um, so it, it has nowhere to go except you know, the back end of the fire. You don't want to, um, this is a common mistake that I see when I, when I hand the torch to uh, my older brother. Uh, is he, he drifts out into the burn unit. And of course, what that does is it creates a small little, you know, not a huge head fire, but it creates a little mini version of a head fire because now it's got the wind in its back and it's got some dry grass out in front of it. And that preheats our wet line and it dries it out. And it just makes it that much more likely with the, all that fuel that uh, that fire can jump across our wet line and our fire. So keep that, keep that right next to your, your wet line. And then you're just going to progress in strips like that. And it's kind of a matter of you learn how to synchronize the timing so that, you know, the wet line, the guy who's put the wet line out, you don't want you don't want to see him a quarter mile away because he's using water that far out and then that's going to dry before you actually get there with the fire. So you're looking behind you to make sure that the line is secure and you're just taking off, peeling off short strips. So here's just a picture of doing that. Uh, my younger brother Brett is blowing the leaf blower at, right before the wet line gets put down. He's just blowing off as much residue as he can to make it fair to dirt. And then the, uh, the guy, Charlie, with the water is coming along and, and making it muddy. And then that fire will get put right here so that it just backs up in this direction. And then, of course, you know, you got to loop around and light the flank and the head fire, which is where it gets real fun. Um, of course, before you do that, you just want to make sure that all your, your lines are secure in the downwind direction. And then, you know, we sometimes we'll actually get the ranger going with the, or the drift torch and just zoom along and, and light off a long strip of head fire. That's fine as long as you have the, that's, that head fire that you like still wants to back, you know, back across the fire break. So you need to make sure you can, you can put that out and not have two miles of fire that you 
camped out. And this is where the leaf blowers really look nice. And uh, that's just kind of a parting shot that shows a great big head fire that we lit, and it's got this nice green fire rig. I don't know how visible that is to the you guys in the audience. But that's when the, the hawks come soaring in, and they're looking for dinner. This is like the dinner bell for all the avian predators. And that's when it's really fun if you just get to sit around and, and watch that fire work. Then what the, the real true burn gurus, which I'm not, let's we'll, we'll say this is called mop up. I just say follow up. You know, you need to walk the perimeter or drive the perimeter for the burn unit and sure that looks okay. If you've got a uh, call into the sheriff still, you know, call them back, say we're all done, things look good, don't come here. Um, and if you've done a one one burn, you probably should just be aware for the next couple of days you'll still have some smoldering trees in there, some smoldering logs, and if the wind were to pick up and get real dry, um, you need to get phone calls. <coughs> so, uh, resources real quick. Um, I really, I don't, there's some fan, uh, fancy burn forecast sites that are out there. I really don't use them. I just go to the National Weather Service. They've got that hourly chart that shows how, hour by hour. Temperature, humidity, wind, all that stuff. That's really nice. So you just enter in your town and state and go there. Um, if you've never written a burn plan, I recommend getting a template from online or from your state NRCS agency. Um, it just helps you make sure you log all your I's and cross all your T's. Then this is kind of a neat if, you, if you're into casual reading of academia, um, just check out that title. And then the final lesson which is that there's a big difference, a big distinction to be made, in my mind, between control burning, which is fun, or it should, should be very fun, and firefighting, which is very, very stressful. So, you know, start by talking to a professional, get yourself a plan, build good fire breaks, don't skim when it's not cheating, but make really good fire breaks, and that, that just lets you enjoy that experience. That's it. Yay. He asked if you have, let's say, some one to three inch diameter red oaks or young oaks in your timber, and, and is that going to cause a problem? Uh, yeah, I think it probably will. It, it kind of goes back to, remember I showed you the slide where if the temperature gets up to 122 to 131 on that tissue, it's going to cause some damage. So it's going to depend on you know, how much fuel there is in that spot around those oaks as to whether that temperature heats up enough to do damage. So, yeah, if, if you've got an ample supply of trees and they're in that sapling size already, I would I would hold off on the Could you defend an island of area inside of a burn you know, a square or Yeah, he asked if you could is it possible to defend like a certain zone within the burn unit, like an island to them. And yeah, that's that's always a possibility. Uh, we've done that, you know, we have some people will have like a bird or your birdhouses out in the middle of the CRP and it's right off of your house. And so we mow around those, wait around them, you know, put water around them before they burn. But it just becomes at some point you gotta look at your the scale of things and determine if it's worth, you know, if you've got a hundred trees out there and you can't possibly afford to do it on each one. If you're gonna do like a five or ten acre burn, what's a good crew size to have now? What's a good crew size to have for a five or ten acre burn? Um, if, you, if it's kind of your first attempt at doing it, I would probably look at getting, I just like having three or four people for almost everything we do. So, you know, uh, now you get confident to the point where if you have good fire breaks and you kind of know what's, what's going to happen when you set that fire, I'll do burns and that's like just by myself. That's probably the dumb thing to, me, uh, to admit, but um, yeah, if you've got good fire breaks, it's not hard to do burns with one person, two people, but I would look at the board start. You know, what's the liability? If I have my own fire burn and it gets away from the fence, gets over the neighbor's new season, tree burns the field off and smoke, like you said, on a highway, causes an accident. What kind of puts the liability? Or have you had any problems or issues yourself? 
A lot of you probably heard that because he's asking about what the liability is with burning and, and you know, what's going to happen in fire escapes and causes damage to a structure or something else. Uh, thankfully, I can, I can tell you we've never had a problem and uh, we sure hope we don't. And I guess I'm going to defer to your... <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know really what the answer to that is. I think that's something... I mean, most everybody has a personal liability coverage you know, that covers them. I think that's a question for your insurance agent. I, I think I'm going to stay away from that because I don't have any personal experience. You know, I almost started one one day, but then I checked it out. Honestly, I'll tell you, he, he said he chickened out because he, he really wanted to try one, but he, he got nervous. If, if you have the option, I mean, in Iowa, we have, every county has a conservation board, and I know that Wisconsin and Illinois may not have that, but usually, if you really get into the community of natural resource management to look around, you're going to find a fire crew who's doing some work on public areas in your area. And I would sure encourage you to give them a call and, you know, ask them, tell them what you, you know, that you'd like to learn more about it, you'd like to help out, volunteer, go, you can just observe how they do that. And, or if, if, if you have to, I recommend the landowners hire somebody to do your first burn for you and then help them. And you'll start to learn, you know, okay, I see what goes into it, and, and you, you get more confidence by observing other people do that. Uh, in Illinois, where I live, uh, the local federal burn chapter, they do a lot of burn. Why do you use that type of local federal burn chapter? They'll probably be right for you. That's a good tip. You should, yeah, call the Pheasants Forever guys if, they, if you have them around. They have a burn school. Yeah. They have Pheasants Forever does? Yeah. Pheasants Forever has a burn school, he said. So, yeah, I mean, there's there's some burn schools that happen, depend, just depends on your area. But, you know, call around and ask professionals. Sometimes you have more of a rural area, so your local volunteer fire departments will come out and do it for you for training. And, you know, usually give them a hundred, two hundred dollar dollar donation, which is cheap insurance. Yeah, there's that too. Because you are liable for whatever happens. Yeah, sometimes your volunteer fire departments will come out, but I'll tell you that my experience with that has been that they usually do it once or twice, and then if you need to keep burning an area, they're probably good at it, but it just depends on maybe how much money you get. That's right. Yes? I volunteer in Wayne County at the Indian Creek Nature Center, and we have a burn school probably. It depends upon the interest, but usually twice a year, once in the spring and once in the, the fall, and um, we have like a two or three hour, you know, like today, yep. and, and then lunch, and then we go out and we'll usually burn about 15 to 20 acres and give everybody a chance to do every job. And then we, we help them if they we give each other phone numbers and help each other out. And that's in the Cedar Rapids area? It's, uh, yeah. Cedar Rapids, Iowa. So in Green Creek Nature yep. Center. You have to be around the driving distance to see a rabbit. She says they do burn school. school a couple times a year. Mm -hmm. One more. John. On um, a woodland burn <coughs> relatively steep ravine, do you always follow the rule of fire goes up? Oh, yeah. He, he said, uh, do you always follow the rule that fire goes uphill when you've got real steep terrain, like in a woodland with ravines? Yeah, I didn't mention anything about, you know, but generally speaking, if you've got a steep hill so fire will go i mean it'll probably go down that hill too but not as hot so it doesn't preheat and the heat rise like, like you lift the fire at the bottom of the hill uh, but uh you know i think i think that's just a case for experimentation on your part it depends on the fuel load and how steep and the wind that day Possibly, possibly, possibly lighting on the top and letting it burn downhill would, would act like a backfire, but it, it's really going to depend on the conditions that day on the ground. And, uh, yeah. All right, great. Thank you. Thank you.